What a pleasure to welcome back the soldiers of the Israel National Defense College. It's a high honor. It's a high honor and a great joy to see you again. Our guests are the very best of Israel, born to lead, trained to command, and able and willing to shoulder the yoke of defending the Jewish state. They have been handpicked by the chief of staff of the IDF to participate in this year-long course away from their field commands. They have the time and the space to think and to study anything and everything that will allow them to be better in terms of their future leadership. Part of the course is to visit the United States, where they have met with senior political, military, and economic leaders. While in the United States, they get to know the American Jewish community. And part of that effort brings them to us now for the third year running. Friends, as much as it is a pleasure to host you, know that you give back to us much more. You remind us of the miracle of Jewish independence and the Yisurei Ahava, the joyous burdens of love required for its preservation. Judaism despises war. We have always maintained that there will come a day of tranquility and peace when nations will know war no more, when the lion shall lie down with the lamb and all will be tranquil. Overwhelmingly in Judaism, our heroes were scholars, teachers, philosophers, poets, not military figures. Ezehu Gibor asked the sages, who is a hero? One who turns an enemy into a friend. But we are not pacifists. There are occasions, and Judaism discusses these at great lengths, when the refusal to use force is not only unwise, but is downright immoral. If a neighbor arises to kill you, you must arise earlier to thwart him. For as our teachers teach us, while each life is precious in the sight of God, my life is no less valuable than his. Turning the other cheek might sound good if it's someone else's cheek. But Judaism never embraced that philosophy. It took 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to harden our ancestors to the burdens of self-defense and liberty. And therefore, in the cause of self-defense, to preserve life and liberty, there can be valor in war. There is no courage quite like courage on the battlefield. Courage is not the absence of fear, but the strength to overcome fear, sacrifice, friendship, loyalty, leadership, firmness of purpose in defense of the homeland. These are virtues that in the heat of battle few of us can be confident we possess. None of us knows that if the time ever came that required screwing our courage to the sticking place, that we would prevail over ourselves. And therefore, the commanders with us tonight are among the select group of us who, swift as eagles and strong as lions, ensure our freedoms including the freedom to criticize the very people who make that possible. And so, honored guests, we say to you what Moses said to Joshua. Chazak ve'ematz ve'adonai hu ha'olech lefanecha. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not and do not falter. And may the eternal God be with you. If I were to teach at the INDC about American Jews, I would emphasize two central points. First, we are one people. 
Never forget that the central fact of Jewish existence is our collective identity. We are a people, one people. We do not see ourselves simply as a faith community. It is not Torah that produced Jews. Jews produced Torah. Our uncompromising loyalty to this fundamental idea and the centrality and the unity of the Jewish people more than anything else accounts for us still being here 3,000 years later. Would it not for us? What would consume so much of the attention of the world? There are only 14 million of us. If you were to ask how many Jews are there in the world, the Chinese might tell you, oh, around half a billion. The Japanese might say 300 million. Others might say, I have no idea, but too many. 14 million. And that's a generous counting. 0.2% of humanity, a statistical mistake, a rounding error. One wonders what all the fuss is about. Why the eagerness to point out our flaws? And yes, like everyone else, Jews have flaws. So much puffed up self-righteousness to single out the Jews and the Jewish state for alleged offenses, some of which may even be true. I'm just saying. One wonders why such intense focus on our imperfections when there are so many other far more egregious offenses in the world. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims and Christians butchered and millions dispossessed. The lack of any respect for human dignity in so many places around the world. The widespread denial of human and political rights, the persecution of women and gay people, the abject poverty that exists around the world. I'm just saying, one wonders why the Jews? And why Israel come under such opprobrium all the time? Even Israel's humanitarian efforts in Nepal were criticized as a cynical plot to whitewash Israel's alleged crimes at home. Even that marvelous delegation of the IDF sent to treat suffering Nepalese and that saved so many lives even they were criticized. Even after Tel Aviv was voted among the most gay-friendly cities in the world, Israelis are accused of pinkwashing. You know what that is? Have you heard that term? Used against Israel, implying that the protection of gay rights is simply a ploy that Israel uses in order to oppress so many other people in the West Bank and Gaza. In these unprecedentedly trying times, we must preserve and strengthen the unity of the Jewish people. We cannot continue to live as a people without Israel. The heart of the Jewish world, its beating pulse, is Israel. We cannot be a people today without Israel. More Jews live in Israel now than in the United States. And sometime within the next 20 years, more Jews will be living in Israel than all other places in the world combined. The state of Israel keeps the modern Jewish people alive, not only as a place of refuge. Israel is the most eloquent expression of Jewish peoplehood in our days. It is one of the great wonders of the world, the recreation and restoration of the national home and the national spirit of the Jewish people. Israel has universal significance. Its triumph is the triumph of the human spirit. 
And it is this that the soldiers of the IDF preserve, protect, and defend not only their own families, but the entire Jewish family born in antiquity, and all 14 million of us still living, still creating, still dreaming of a better world, a world at peace, where all shall sit under vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid. Two, we need each other. American Jews need Israel, and Israel needs American Jews. First, because that's the whole point. We are responsible one for the other since the days of Moses. Not with you alone do I make this covenant, but with those who are with us here this day and those who are not with us the, to this day. Kol Yisrael Arevin Zebazeh, all Jews are responsible one for the other. But even if you discount these core Jewish values, and you are simply, say, a politician who is under constant political pressure, or you are a 21st century universalist who believes that religion is the problem, not the solution, still, American Jews are a security asset of the highest order for Israel. Were it not for American Jews, the nature of the American-Israel relationship might look more like that of Western Europe. Values matter. The perception that Israel is a decent and moral country is the key ingredient of American political support. And this task is undertaken primarily by Jews who are facing an increasingly well-financed and determined force whose sole purpose is to defame and sully Israel's name. No one should consciously undermine the essential ties that bind us. Not the Knesset, not the government, not the Orthodox establishment, and not American Jews. American Jews should remember that Israel is a liberal democracy. Zionism was conceived by liberals and dedicated to the proposition of equal rights and equal dignity. I believe in social criticism. All of Judaism is based on social rebuke. The Bible insists, rebuke and rebuke again your fellow. If something is wrong in society, you must criticize to make it better. This is the democratic way. I reject the idea that a supporter of Israel cannot also be a critic of Israel. I do not believe that Israel is perfect, and I do not believe that Israel is beyond reproach. But what would, she, what would we make of people who with sublime composure and relative indifference tolerate all the inhuman, savage outrages of the world, but are apoplectic about democratic Israel's even perceived minor violations. Now, other people's crimes do not excuse your own crimes. No one has the right to wrong someone, even if they have been wrong themselves. But this excessive preoccupation with Israel shuts down any capacity for self-reflection or reason discussion and leads to a form of moral paralysis. All those who truly care about preventing bloodshed in Gaza? Where are you? Now is the time, before the next war, 
to address the root cause and to restrain the brutal fundamentalist regime of Hamas. Instead, we hear news of new flotillas, flotillas of futility, a form of moral paralysis. All those who truly seek to prevent the loss of life in Lebanon, where are you? Now is the time, before the next war, to address the root cause and to restrain Hezbollah. Instead, blind eyes turn to the continuing Iranian stockpiling of ever more accurate and deadly missiles. Where are you, those of you who, clear to claim, who care to claim to care about Lebanon? The psalmist, in a fit of exasperation and disillusionment, turned to the heavens and cried, Why do the nations rage and imagine things that are not? Why do the nations rage, imagining things that are not? What are humanitarians who insist that they are not anti-Semitic, only anti-Zionist? What are they doing on the side of Hamas and Hezbollah? What are Democrats doing on the side of autocrats? What are the enlightened doing on the side of those who live in medieval shadows? It is reflective of the mass confusion of our era when we allow a small democracy fighting for its life in the world's worst neighborhood to be savage as if it were an anti-democratic dictatorship, savaged by forces that are themselves anti-democratic and who perversely pervert the very language of human rights that we progressives have developed over centuries. Human rights is drained of meaning. Liberalism is drained of meaning. Progressivism is drained of meaning. They have become ugly distortions Weapons used by the very opponents of progress to attack those who, while imperfect, do their best to reach the highest standards of decency. As you know, a synagogue delegation will be traveling to Eastern Europe in July. One of the places we will visit is Theresienstadt the infamous concentration camp where tens of thousands of Jews died and from where many tens of thousands were transported to Auschwitz and Treblinka. Theresienstadt was a uniquely ghoulish place, even by Nazi standards. It was not an extermination camp, but a prison where the Germans concentrated Czech Jews for eventual transportation to death camps. They used Theresienstadt for propaganda, making films purporting to show the world how well they treated Jewish prisoners. Many Jewish artists, authors, and musicians were imprisoned in Theresien, leaving behind a moving and tragic collection of paintings, drawings, and compositions. There was even an orchestra in the camp. Brundabar, the children's opera, was performed in Theresienstadt. When you visit the camp, what strikes you is how utterly normal everything looks. Theresien is a town. It has everything that other towns have. Families now live in the barracks of the prisoners. To get to the camp, you travel through neighborhoods of normalcy. You cross streets, children play, people go on with their daily lives as if nothing happened all those years ago. I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong here. I'm certainly not suggesting that the younger generations are responsible for the deeds of their parents and grandparents. I'm simply noticed that people were prepared to live in the middle of this island of infamy where tens of 
thousands suffered and where over 30,000 perished. In the end, life moves on. Your tragedies are your tragedies, but others get on with life. Thousands of visitors a day come to that site, but the people who live there live normal lives. They have families there. They raise children there. They have pets. They have satellite television. Your tragedy is not their tragedy. They live as if nothing happened there. After all, it's been 70 years, almost to the day, since the liberation of Theresienstadt. In the end, Jewish history is our history. If Israel were to ever lose a war, there would be many headlines, many books would be published, many people would express real and sincere sadness, some would weep, a few would repent. But in the end, they would move on. We would be left with the tragedy. To this day, 2,000 years later, we Jews mourn the destruction of the Jerusalem temple by the Romans. For everyone else, it's a small piece of history, a footnote, if they even know it. For us, after two millennia, it is still an open wound, and it will never fully heal. So in the end, Jewish history is our responsibility. Jewish destiny is our responsibility. Jewish life is our responsibility. The Jewish state is our responsibility. May we prove worthy and may we endure. Now and forever.